So now we're in a chapter two, talking about measurement and problem solving, more about like sign of notation, especially significant figures. So we oftentimes use sign of notation uh, to describe both very large and very small numbers. So when we have something we'll talk about in the future with the metric system, we can really use the same system to talk about very, very big things like stars and very small things like atoms. And just so we know that the, the, uh, the scientific notation shows two parts, the, the base part, the decimal part. So starting with the base unit and then following with the decimal points up to however many sig figs you have, and then the exponential part. And it's always, so we, we typically use base 10. Uh, I mean, most everyone here on earth uses base 10, uh, but 10 raised to some sort of exponent n. So of course, positive for big numbers, negative for smaller numbers. So when you read uh, sign of notation in the base of 10, so anything raised to the zero power, except for zero, is one. So the base, the, the first unit is, the uh, the base unit the the one through nine uh, ten of the first that's uh, ten ten of the second that's uh, one with two zeros a hundred and so on so the exponents that way and the negative exponents uh, it's one over ten to whatever base it is so ten to the minus one is one over ten ten to the minus two is one over ten times ten or one over uh, 100 or 0 0.01 and so on. So that's the that's the nature of our unit system, right? So start with a zero unit and then to the right of the decimal point, uh, it's to the 10 to the negative exponents and then to the left of the uh, base unit is the are the positive exponents. So to change a number to sign of notation, uh, you have to look at the, the first number and then uh, look at uh, and then uh, start with the base unit and then count that number up or down to that base exponent. So that way the, the, the number can convert that way. So for instance here, so 5,983. So you have to move start with a five and then you have to move three spots over. And so to go to the base unit because of that, it is then 5.983 times 10 to the three to show that if you multiply that, you know what he's gonna look at, if you multiply that number by a thousand, you get the original number. And then 0 .000034, 3034. So uh, looking at that, you have to, you start with 3.4, and then you get to, to the, the 3, you have to move over 4 spots. So that is then 3.4 times 10 to the minus 4. So depending on if you move right or left, so for big numbers you move, you have to do the positive exponents. For small numbers you have to use the negative exponents. So also with any type of measurement there is uncertainty. So uh, we got to watch out uh, for precision. Um, precision, well, precision is, is more how repeatable uh, a, um, a measurement is. And so uh, if a measurement is more precise, uh, that means that it's, it's got more significant figures. And we talk about this before. It's more repeatable. It's, it's more uh, kind of set in the number of times you can do it. And the more of these digits, the more the more the significant figures. It tells us how well we know something. And then at the end, there's the uncertainty. Uh, the uncertainty is we're not entirely sure about the, the last digit. We know things to a certain range, and uncertainty tells us what we know and what uh, how we know well. We know it in a range of things. So, for instance, here global temperatures risen by 0.6 degrees Celsius in the past century, and that also means that the the uh, the uncertainty of that is plus or minus 0.1 Celsius, and so that means the range could be 0.7 or as low as 0.5. So we we know, and then this is actually also statistics. This is typically the standard deviation. So we are 68 percent sure it's in this range. So that's that's uh, if you go and take statistics, that's that's where these numbers come from. 
So it's unlikely that uh, that the, the, the temperature would would be as high as one degree Celsius because of uh, the measurement. So it becomes less in likely that that's true. So uh, that's what we mean by uh, uncertainty and, and where we get the, the numbers so that we can report a number, but then we, we're certain to a certain degree. So with the scientific notation, with the, with the significant figures, uh, the last digit is the one typically that we don't entirely know, that the last digit is typically where the uncertainty is. So in the measurement, and this is, uh, I'm going to show you some examples now. And part of this is outdated. I mean, not necessarily the uncertainty, but uh, computers are uh, now the ones that take the measurements. That's Computers take the measurements much more than humans do. And a sig fig, a sig fig is, in significant figures, I know I'm jumping, I'm, I'm truncating the sig fig. Sig figs tells us how well we, we know something. The more sig figs, the, the, the better we know things. So for instance here, let's look at this example measuring tenths of a gram. So uh, if you look at this reading, uh, so, and this unit is in grams, and if you look at this, this, this blow up here in the line, so the, the big line there is zero, and then the next tick there is five. So the first one is, that's one. So we, we're certain that it weighs more than one gram. And then we're looking at there and is, like where where does this lie and uh it looks like it's about a little bit maybe a third way down i could even say this is 1.2 grams but what the heck but i mean we can estimate the last digit as being 1.3 uh but then we can kind of guess then that there's going to be a plus or minus of a 0.1 gram with that i mean i i told you that i would probably say this is 0.2 but i mean uh, but I mean, yeah, 1.3 is reasonable as well, but then again, we're both within the, the uncertainty range. So this is where the you as the, as the user can do this. Of course, like I said, a lot of computers use this now. We, we have digital scales rather than analog scales. So uh, digit, if you're wondering what the difference between digital and analog, digital uses a specific discrete number and an analog is continuous. Uh, so like if you have an analog um, speedometer in your car, it has a, a dial and a line where you can read your speed and, and a digital uh, speedometer is just going to give you a number. So that's the difference if you say digital and analog. This is an analog scale, but we can, can uh, estimate the, the um, amount, or the, estimate the mass, or I guess this would be weight, uh, although I guess we do use them interchangeably, but uh, the... Um, we can estimate the mass from that. Uh, mass is the amount of matter, weight is a force due to gravity. But I mean, it, we are measuring weight, but from that we are, are dividing by gravity then to get the, the mass. So let's say we have a different scale. So here now, instead we have uh, a tenths uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of the scale. So from this, we can look at the one and there's one tick, a second thing. So we know that it's, it's 1.2, but we don't know. Uh, and we know it's somewhere between 1.2 and 1.3. And where is it? It's a little bit more than halfway. So say 1.26. So you're, you're, we're six tenths of the way to the next tick over. And then again, you have the uncertainty there. So that's, that's how you can read things using analog uh, scales. And... So let's go on and talk about significant figures and what they mean in a measurement. So uh, first of all, any non-zero digits are significant. So uh, interior zeros are significant and trailing zeros are significant. And any trailing zeros that fall before a decimal point are significant. Uh, but and then we'll talk about ambiguous numbers there. So you gotta watch out with, with ambiguous numbers. So leading zeros uh, before a um, before a, a, like a decimal point, they are not significant. They're, that one's only to describe the decimal point. And also trailing zeros, uh, they these typically imply that it's ambiguous. So this is something you should uh, actually avoid doing. It's better to put things in scientific notation. So uh, there are certain numbers that have an unlimited number of sig figs. So for instance, 
10 pencils, that, that means there's an infinite number of significant figures. When you use a discrete number, uh, then uh, that that is uh, that's that means there's an infinite number of decimal points. So like like I have two hands, for instance. I mean that's not one significant figure. That means it's infinite significant significant figures with that uh, integral numbers. So that a prime equation like uh, so. Uh, so a radius is is one half the diameter, a diameter divided by two. That has an infinite number of significant figures. You can consider that to be discrete. Discrete means exact. And also define quantities. So an inch, inch is, for instance, is defined as 2.54 centimeters. So uh, that's that's an exact number. That 2.54 centimeters does not have three sig figs. That has an infinite number of sig figs. So let's look at this these examples. So the first one. 0 0.0035, so the zeros to the left are insignificant, and we first get to the three, so this number here has two sig figs. So 1.080, so the zeros to the right are significant, so this tells us that there are four significant figures, so one, zero, eight, zero, those four numbers are all significant. Uh, 2,371, uh, these are all non-zero uh, numbers, so all four of these are saving it. That's four sig figs. Uh, 2.97 times 10 to the 5. So looking at this, there are three significant numbers. 2.97, that has three significant figures, therefore three sig figs for that. So a dozen is 12. This is a definition. This has infinite sig figs. Uh, 100.00, uh, this tells us, you know, that that, uh, that we're, we are... We went into extra effort to cement down that we know that this 100 is significant down to the the, the hundredths place, and therefore it has five sig figs. 100,000. This is ambiguous. We don't really know if this has uh, if, if how many sig figs is, is here. This is this should uh, generally speaking be avoided because we really don't know. So for rounding, when you round numbers. Uh, so we need to round them with res respect to the, to the precision of the data. So uh, we have to keep to what the data is and where we're going here. For calculations, uh, round only at the final answer. Don't do off between the steps. Uh, the reason for that is you can get something called truncation error. Truncation means truncate. To truncate something means you chop off the last couple of digits. So uh, th you can cause, like I said, truncation error to occur over time, which can drift your data one way or the other. So round at the end for that. So, and, uh, and at the last digit to be dropped, decide in which direction, ignore the digits to the right of it. So look at the last digit, for instance. And, uh, and if you, for uh, if you round down, it's to four or less, and you round up, it's five or more. So uh, that we're we're following the this um, uh, uh, whatever rule for for this class. Some some uh, people have suggested that we should always round up or round down to an even number, but we're gonna do the round up for five or more rather than than round to an even number. So for multiplication and division rules, uh, so whenever you multiply and divide, whatever operation has the fewest number of significant figures, the answer has to have that number of significant figures. And uh, we, we don't do this until the end. So don't, don't do the truncation error, like I said. Do the, the, uh, the operations on the number of sig figs at the end. Uh, so... For instance, here, you look at an example, you have three numbers, uh, 5.02 has three sig figs, 89.667 has five significant figures, and 0 0.10 has two sig figs. You do the multiplication, put in your calculator, and at the end, uh, the, the uh, one of the lowest sig figs is, is the 0 0.10, therefore the answer has to have two sig figs, and so the answer for this multiplication is 45. Yeah, so... New, new thing, huh? Right? New, new uh, special brand of mathematics so you can say how well we know something. So we know this now to 45, you know, probably plus or minus one is how well we know this answer. 
So same thing with division. So four sig figs divided by three sig figs, you get the answer and you have to round it to three significant figures. And notice that the, that the, uh, that the last digit, so 9.659, you round up to 9.966. So you round, you round it at, the, at that uh, sig fig number. So addition subtraction rule. So this is different than the um, than the multiplication division. We only know uh, the result to that has the um, the you have to look at the at what decimal place the operation takes place. So whereas multiplication division, we look at the actual number of sig figs, but addition and subtraction, you have to look to the last digit of known precision. So you can have a really amazing uh, precise measurement and you can have a really crappy one. And if you would add and subtract them, you have to, you only know it to the degree of the, of the, uh, the less known quantity. So because for us as scientists, we are reporting at what we know. So for instance here, uh, if you have the quantity 5.74, add it to 0.823 and 2.651, Adding these together, the uh, thing is with the 5.74, we don't know the digits after 0.4. So it could really be, we, it's probably, you know, 4, 3, 2, or 1 or, or lower than that. Uh, so because, because it would, you know, we're rounding down at that point in time. But we really don't know. So when you, can, when you do the operation, you put in your calculator, you get 9.214. But then you truncate it at, at the uh, the point four because uh, I'm sorry at the at the at that that four you truncate that four off because we just not entirely sure about the 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 rest of the um, of the decimal places. So another one here. So you can see four point eight and three point nine six five. Uh, if you do this subtraction operation. Uh, we can only say we're we're certain for this answer to be at 0 0.8. And so, if you're thinking in terms of sig figs, you're like, oh man, I got a, I got something two sig figs, and something has four sig figs, and I do subtraction, I'm only left with one. So yeah, you can lose sig figs in the operations. So this is an interesting point of them. Uh, so what do you do when you do both multiplication, and division, and addition and subtraction? So, uh, and this is just general order of operations. So the order of operations are parentheses first, then exponents, then addition, subtraction, then uh, addition and subtraction, I'm sorry, addition, multiplication, then addition, I'm sorry, I, let me start over. Parentheses first, then uh, logarithms and exponents, then uh, multiplication, division, then addition and subtraction, and always go from left to right. So, but you do the, the order that way. So. Uh, left to right, but then in the order of parentheses first, then powers and logarithms, then uh, subtraction, I'm sorry, uh, multiplication, division, then uh, addition, subtraction, and, and so on. So let's look at this. So if you look at the, the first one here, 3.489 times the quantity 5.67 minus 2.3, uh, you have to do the parentheses first, do the, the first operation first, and then uh, you um, do the multiplication. And uh, in this operation though, you only, uh, we, we still do the thing where we round at the end. So we, we keep the units for, I mean, it, it, by the laws of sig figs, right? You should make that 3.4, but we keep that 3.37. But then at the end, uh, when we do the multiplication, we have to remember though that, uh, that we only have two sig figs. So at the end, we get 11.758, but then we round it to the two sig figs. So uh, kind of an interesting way of doing that. So, uh, and that is the um, following up with that, that's just rounding up. So uh, we also, in uh, chemistry and science in general, we typically use the uh, metric system. So the metric system is here, and uh, we're, we're thinking about changing it. Uh, the, so the, the use, right now, a kilogram, for instance, is a block of platinum. 
but we're thinking about changing it to silicon. Right now we're basing them all off of carbon and a kilogram off of a block of uh, platinum and a meter off of uh, a certain amount of wavelengths of light. And the second, the second and the meter actually are both defined by by time and distance and and uh, but uh, we we are thinking about changing the kilogram and the mole. So um, second, well, the nice thing about seconds is uh, that's something everyone agrees on here on Earth. Uh, we have a different we no one no one has a different way of defining time. You know, thank goodness. Uh, but um, we uh, we do have differing opinions on on uh, length, so meters and mass. So. In the United States and some other countries, we can use feet, miles, and and pounds for mass. Uh, and also, the United States typically use Fahrenheit instead of Kelvin. So Kelvin, and also Kelvin and Celsius, they're interchangeable. We'll talk about that in uh, in later chapters. But but uh, as far as unit wise, a Kelvin and a Celsius are the same units. Uh, it's just there the magnitude is different. Uh, so magnitude is the number, but the unit themselves, a step in Kelvin is same as a is, is same as a step in Celsius. But uh, length, this is the uh, metric system. So length is a meter, uh, mass is a kilogram, and this is also known as the MKS system. So uh, and where m is meter, k is kilogram, s is second. Uh, so the temperature then is Kelvin. But everyone agrees on, on the temperature, so we don't really include that in the MKS system. And uh, we have other derived units from this, for for instance, like a Newton or a Joule or a Watt. So these are other units that are based off of this. And that's if you, you can study this more if you take physics classes, but this is based off of the meter, kilogram, and second. So let's start with the length. And we have uh, that time and length is, is uh, agreed. And uh, so it's the time. So a meter is that the light travels in a vacuum at uh, 1, 2, 299,792,045 uh, seconds. So we, we uh, you know, base this off of uh, the, the speed of light. So and we, we uh, in the vacuum, in a vacuum. And uh, we also, uh, well, this is also based off of uh, a cesium atom. Uh, that's one thing that's not really mentioned in the book. It's, it's also the cesium atom. So, uh, well, uh, this is not entirely accurate. We're not necessarily based on the Planck's constant. We, we, um, we, right now, we still have the, the, um, the kilogram. But uh, we're, we're looking to change it. So defining this with Planck's constant and uh, Planck's constant. And um, so, but, but from these, uh, kilogram and the meter can be determined by using these two. So uh, there is a little bit of leeway here for experimentation, but we're, um, we're, we're working on it. So... Uh, and it's the standard time, and as I mentioned, this is from the transition of a cesium atom. So look at the wavelength of light from a cesium atom. So uh, looking at uh, the, so defining the meter, defining the second, and then previously defining the kilogram by this. Uh, so we can figure all these out together. And Planck's constant, this is, this is a, uh, well, as mentioned, it's a constant. So it's it's uh, as we learn more about this constant, we can learn more about, and we get more sig figs. This is how well we know uh, the different amounts. Like I said, we've abandoned the the mass of the the platinum. So uh, kilograms, measure of mass. Uh, difference between weight uh, is weight is a force, and mass is the amount of matter. So for instance, if you're out in space, you can say you're weightless, but you're not massless. So if you took a big, like if you're in, in the International Space Station and you grab a 10 kilogram ball and you shake it, it's gonna be as hard to shake it as it is on Earth because you're dealing with the inertia. The inertia is resistance to, to motion. So uh, that's, that's the, it's gonna have the same feeling up in space, but uh, it can be weightless. And 
uh, but not massless. Well, you can be massless, you just wouldn't be matter anymore. And so weight depends on gravity. Uh, so your weight, for instance, is generally speaking about one sixth on the moon or one third on Mars as is on Earth. And that's just because the gravity is different in those areas. So what's nice about the metric system is that you can have a base unit, so something like a meter, but then you can talk about things in huge amounts. You can also talk about things in small amounts. And, you know, like, for, for instance, we, you probably are recognizing this in terms of bytes. A byte is not a, a thousand. A byte, uh, well, a, a, a kilobyte is actually a thousand twenty-four bytes, and, a, and it's based off of, of a factor of two. Uh, but this is, you know, the, the metric system is based off of factors of 10, and uh, you can go up. So uh, we don't typically use deca or hecta. We can, we can use that in, um, I mean, some, some uh, air, like uh, in some cultures, I mean, here in the United States, we use acres, for instance, but you can have hectares for, for areas, and that's uh, it's a, a hectare is 100 square meters, for instance. Uh, and deca, I used to live in Hungary, and you could order things in decagrams uh, was, was uh, what they did. But you, you don't typically uh, do that as much. But we, we typically go on to the, the kilo, mega, giga, and tera. And you can keep on going, of course. And then for small, uh, deca, centa, milla, micro, nano, pico, femto. And I mean, of course, you can go a lower than that. Addo is after that. Uh, but... Um, we, we don't use deca as much. Uh, a liter a uh, volume, for instance, is actually a cubic decimeter. So one, a, a cube of each side is one-tenth of a meter. That's a, that's a liter, for instance. Uh, a centimeter, we use this colloquially quite a bit, and milli, millimeter. All right, so we, it's, it's, a, it's a very rare that we actually use a deca and centa. We mostly use the, the, the uh, and various 10 to the third, you know, multiplications. So, uh, but we're going to use the, the proper prefix multiplier, and this is just something we do to make things easier to write. And this is probably, it's not so hard in computers, but we typically do it for, for like, you know, writing things down. Instead of saying some in 10 to the minus 9, for instance, we use nano. So, or a little p for pico for 10 to the minus 12. So, which one should you use? Uh, we tend to think more positive. So uh, for a chemical bond is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10 uh, meters. Uh, so that would be 0.12 nanometers, or it would be 120 picometers. Uh, we probably go for the more positive one, for instance, because that's the, the one's higher, because we usually not to like to think in terms of, of decimals. So just that's just kind of a human trait. Although it, mathematically it's the same, it just it makes us feel more comfortable to see 120 picometers instead of uh, 1.2 nanometers. And unfortunately, though, when you say 120 picometers, it's implying you have three sig figs, and it really has only two sig figs. Uh, so that that is one uh, you know drawback in doing this. And I mentioned before uh, the the um, the volume of, of derived units. So a, a liter, for instance, is a cubic deciliter, uh, and uh, a cubic centimeter. Uh, so a cc. So if you see ccs, that's also the same thing as a milliliter. So one thousandth of a liter is the same thing as a cubic centimeter. So and cubic millimeters. So. Uh, these are various units of volume. We typically use the liter is, is the more commonly one used, at least in, in science. Uh, you can see certain things like, I mean, in medicine, a lot of times they say cc's for, and that's, this, I mean, in chemistry, we, we call it milliliters, but cubic centimeters is the same thing as a milliliter. So let's uh, look at some of these. Uh, let's do a problem that requires critical thinking. And uh, one thing about chemistry that uh, students struggle with is that there's no set way of solving problems. So you, you can't just go and memorize how to solve every problem. You have to reason your way through every single problem. And, uh, but after you do this some time, you get some sort of uh, intuition on how to solve these problems. So the strategies, it's, uh, you kind of have to 
look at the the problem and to figure out what information you what 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 actually is the problem is what information do you want to have what information is given uh, sometimes they can give you extra information so you have to figure out if if which information is good and which information is bad and then you have to come up with an idea how you get to that problem so that's the problem solving you have to look at the what's given uh, where you want to go and then you have to come up with an idea how to solve the problem and quite frequently involves dimensional analysis so and unit conversion so uh, you'll see this up and again and using dimensional analysis and uh, you can then use the units essentially what you do is you multiply by one and uh, we can you know, show you later on we talk go further into dimensional analysis and uh, just the units then convert and, and you you kind of know you're on the right spot if all the units convert to where you want it to go also there can be a specific equation so using a specific equation to to solve that and, and honestly sometimes you're combined sometimes there's multiple steps sometimes the equation gives you an answer in a different unit and then you have to do a unit conversion to get the unit that you want so it just depends so uh, and when you do this, the dimensional analysis, like I mentioned before, it's kind of like you, you multiply everything by one. And, uh, and then this is known as dimensional analysis. And when you, you know you're on the right track uh, if the units get canceled out. And uh, try and keep it organized. One thing about dimensional analysis is keep it organized so that you can see where the units are going and where they're not. So... Uh, this is a general thing, and I, I think I mentioned before, you, it's, it's sort of like dividing by or multiplying by one. Uh, so you have things like a dozen divided by 12. So uh, a dozen is 12, so you're multiplying by one. So that's kind of the, the uh, thing you're, you're going for. So converting between units. So when we have these, again, it's your, your, I, I see this as you're multiplying by one. So you're looking at this and you go through and you and you have the units and the units work out and they cancel. So, but the 2.54 centimeters, this is something that is exact. So for instance, I say I wanna ha see how something that's 44.7 centimeters, how many inches is that? So if I need the answer in, in, in inches, I can multiply it by the unit one, one inch is 2.54 centimeters. The centimeters cancel and then 44.7 divided by 2.54 and you get 17.6 inches and although not not a listed 2.54 is an exact number so you even though both of these numbers have three sig figs 2.54 actually has infinite sig figs in this case so and as mentioned it's sort of like you're multiplying by one so you can multiply anything by one as many times as you want right and it's mathematically giving you the same thing so that's one thing that's nice, multiplying by one, same thing. So uh, for solution maps, and this is something as an organizational thing, and uh, if, you, if you want, feel free to skip some of these steps. I, I've been known to skip steps in, in, in uh, problem solving, like uh, for especially ones that, that go across just base units, I can, I can just skip those steps. So it's, it's up to you, uh, but uh, this is the more exact way to go. And then the solution maps, this is, well, the solution maps, these should kind of like show diagrams, bo boxes, and then, and then uh, you can then put in the numbers for the dimensional analysis. So uh, for instance, here, the inches of centimeters, uh, you multiply by 2.54, and then centimeters, inches, you divide by 2.54. So it's kind of like showing this way the direction, and then you know which way to put the, uh, the, the numbers in the equation. So general problem solving, figure out what the given information is, figure out where you must go. Honestly, I usually start out, I, I, I like to think of the end. I, I usually think of where I'm going before I think about what I know, but because uh, I just, I like results, but it's, it's however, whatever works for you. And then you got to figure out the way how to get there. So uh, solution map, uh, you can, you, I mean, here in the book it goes through here. You don't have to necessarily do that. I mean, you can go right into the dimensional analysis, but the dimensional analysis can be in a solution map because you're looking at the units. So sort and strategize. So uh, you can kind of do this in your head. 
uh, and or you can map it out if you want and then solve it making sure the units and then check it so does this answer make sense so if you well I mean this is something we'll just have to go through with the examples and they say does this make sense well you have to think about does it make sense do the units make sense is the first thing uh, do does the the number make sense does the direction make sense that kind of thing. I mean, what do I mean? Does the direction make sense? Like, well, let's say I have ice cream and I throw it in the oven for four hours and then I get the number. Well, I found out my ice cream cooled. Well, obviously, did you probably have a number off somewhere, right? Because if you throw your ice cream, your, your frozen ice cream in the oven and ends up being colder, then it's, that's a wrong, wrong answer. So that's, you know, kind of, you know, something, you know, that you have to think back to, to a physical operation. Does this make sense? And and actually, you do have to do this in mathematics because uh, when you, for instance, when you square something, you create two answers, and one of them is nonsensical. And if you cube something, you create three answers, and only one of them is real. So that's uh, that's something for other classes. And but uh, you have to after you solve things mathematically, you have to look and see well what number actually makes physical sense. That's that's something you have to do and. In future classes, so you have to check make which one makes physical sense. Some of these you have to figure out which answers don't make sense and which ones. So which ones you have to throw away, and then but when you get an answer, so let's say I, you know, like I want to like what's the mass of a sodium atom, and I and I get like something ten to the twenty three kilograms. I'm like, well, that's like you know something the size of the moon, you know. Obviously, and a sodium atom is not the size of the moon, so maybe it's probably. The minus something, so maybe I should have divided instead of multiplied. So that's kind of like you know you have to look back and see does it make physical sense, and then tweak to see uh, where you made a mistake. So here is an example of a solution map, and like if we want to do from some from centimeters to feet, uh, well, I mean there's probably you can look it up on the internet now. It's probably a direct conversion, but uh, you can. It's it, oftentimes you have to find things step by step by step. So, uh, although you could probably look up the direct conversion, like I said online, but uh, this one here, I mean, if if you were giving it to me, I would start working on this this way. So, for instance, how do we turn 194 centimeters to feet? Well, you start off like, well, I don't know. The, if you know the direct conversion, go ahead and use it. Uh, but if you don't know it, you can do dimensional analysis and like, well, centimeters, well, we can convert to inches and then we can convert to feet from that. And we saw that from the solution map, but I would, you know, you can kind of do that in your head and then you go through this. And, uh, if you notice though, uh, like you say, well, 12 inches there, one foot, 12 inches, that's two sig figs. No, no, that's an exact number. So, uh, the 2.54, that's an exact number. 12 is is inches to a foot, that's an exact number. So this answer has three sig figs, so it's 6.36 feet going that for using the proper sig figs. So uh, what do we do with them in both the numerator and the denominator? So some conversion requirements uh, in, in sol uh, involve solving uh, things both in the numerator and de denominator. So if I wanna go from miles to gallon to kilo, milli, kilometers per liter, for instance. So uh, doing the conversion here, so miles a gallon, uh, well, you, it depends on which order you wanna do. If you wanna do the gallons to liters first, or if you wanna do the miles to kilometers first, it's, it's really up to you. Uh, but uh, you would just switch the order then, the gallon and the kilometer, and uh, but you would you would get the the same answer, but you see the units all check out, and so that's that's one thing is that you you can change the order here if you want, and those are both doing the converting the gallons to liters before the the distance. That's a that's a perfectly valid way of doing it, uh, but it's, but it's entirely up to you how you want to organize it. I guess uh, looking at the top units first is is maybe a good way to go. I don't know. It's however you want to do it. So when you convert units raised to a power, you have to make sure that the units are also raised to that proper power. So this is a common mistake, uh, especially when you do volumes and or or areas. So we probably do more volumes in chemistry, but make sure that you raise things to the proper vo uh, power. So looking at cubes, for instance, so uh, when you convert uh, cubic centimeters to a cubic inch. So uh, 
so uh, a centimeter cubed, you have to, so 2.54 inches a centimeter, you have to cube that entire quantity. So that entire quantity uh, going through. And also note that uh, 2.54 is an exact number. So you can see that you, you keep on, you keep those, all those digits with the, uh, with this, with the calculation. You don't, you don't round that at all to two sig figs. So that's an exact number you keep on going. So uh, let's say we want to do what's, uh, what 1,255 cubic centimeters is in cubic inches. So uh, we, you, we know the, the, uh, the definition of a, of a inch and four, so our centimeters, so we can derive then the cubic centimeters to a cubic inch, then apply the math and then get the answer. And then now we uh, bring it to four sig figs. So going that way. So uh, density, so density, it's mass divided by volume. So uh, density is also known as an intrinsic variable. So an intrinsic variable is something that does not change with amount. So mass, for instance, mass is not intrinsic. Mass changes with the amount of something. But so like if you look at the, the mass of water, um, the mass of water of a liter, that's a kilogram, or the mass of water of an Olympic swimming pool, that's going to, I don't know, it's, it's going to be a lot more than a, than a kilogram. It's going to be several metric tons, right? But what's the density of water, though? The density of water is going to be the same in a kilogram as it is going to be in an ocean, although assuming it's pure water, uh, or a swimming pool, or, or a little drop of water. It's all the same. So... Uh, let's look at this problem. Uh, for a given volume of metal, titanium has less mass than steel. So let's look at this. So the titanium, titanium's uh, density is 4.50 grams per cubic centimeter. And then iron, well, I said steel. Uh, steel t is typically 98% uh, iron and 2% carbon is typically, we say that's carbon steel or structural steel. So it's it's mostly going to be it's going to be very close to iron. So I know that's kind of a, a leap here, but steel and iron are not necessarily necessarily the same thing. But you know, for this problem, it's going to be negligible compared to their densities. So density uh, and density is mass divided by volume, uh, and the units are usually grams per cubic centimeter, or sometimes it's kilograms per liters, depends on. So pay attention to the units. So pay attention to these. Most typically you see it as, uh, as uh, grams per, cu pu per cubic centimeter. So keep that in mind. And like I said, it's an intrinsic variable, so it does not change with the amount of something. So always look to the units. So when you calculate density, uh, you take the, the, the mass divided by the volume. And remember, cubic centimeter is the same thing as a milliliter. So if I mentioned that before. So if we have a volume of 22.5 milliliters and a mass of 27.2 grams, what's the density of this liquid? So density is mass divided by volume, and this is just a straight shot. You can see that this is also, solution-wise, this is known as plug and chug. So you can just put the numbers in the equation and the answer comes right out. So students tend to like these kind of problems, the plug and chug ones. So uh, same thing here. This is, there's a specific equation for this involved in the density. This is the, the plug and chug method, like I said. So we can also use density as a conversion factor in certain things here. So uh, something that's, that's looking the other way, if we have a liquid with a density of 1.32 grams per cubic centimeters, what volume should we measure to deliver of mass of uh, 68.4 grams? So if we have the density, so we start off, we, we want to have mass so let's see here, we have a liquid, we're given a density. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, we know the mass and we know the density, but we wanna know the volume. So uh, starting, starting with the mass, that's on the left, and then we're gonna to have to get rid of the, the, the mass then to do that. So what are we gonna do for here? Uh, starting with the mass, then we're gonna uh, divide by the density and you can, see, I'll show you like, cause, cause you want to get the, um, the, the, uh, 
the units to work out. So remember the 1.32, and it always sticks with the mass. The 1.32 grams goes stick with the mass. So be careful of that when you set up the fractions. So here's the fraction then. So you start off with 68.4 grams, and then uh, the density, you divide by it, 1.32 on the bottom grams uh, times one cubic centimeter. And the next step here, the milliliter per cubic centimeter, you can choose whether or not to use a step. I oftentimes will skip this step and, and either just list the density as milliliter or just, you know, just in my mind, just skip it entirely. And that's entirely fine. So, but it's, it's up to you how you want to do this. So, uh, from this though, you know you need 51.8 milliliters to get the uh, 68.4 grams of liquid. And notice it's all, everything's also three sig figs. And we, I won't talk about sig figs as much uh, through this entire uh, course, but uh, this is a course, it's, it's part of this specific chapter. So I'm mentioning quite a bit. So here's the density of some very common substances. So uh, many woods, charcoal and oak, for instance, have a density of 0.57. Ethanol is there, ice is there. Water is one gram per cubic centimeter. So water is one of the, the ideas in the metric system. So uh, we try to, it was originally, a lot of it's based off of water. Well, Celsius is still based off of water, uh, but uh, yeah, so you can see, another thing about this, uh, you might hear, hear the term specific gravity. Specific gravity is uh, the, the, the density divided by the density of water. So uh, in many cases, then the specific, you say glass of specific gravity is 2.6. It means the density is 2.6 grams per cubic centimeters because you're dividing that of water. The other thing that's nice about density, it tells you what things will float. So anything, at least in water. So anything, uh, uh, so with, if water, so like if you start with water, and you put an ice cube in water, ice has got uh, less, has a smaller density than water. And that means that uh, alpha ice, the most common form of ice, will float in water. If you have pure ethanol and you put an ice cube in pure ethanol, the ice will actually sink. It'll sink down to the bottom. And uh, that's because the ice is more dense than the, than the ethanol kind of thing. So it depends on, on the fluid. So uh, the uh, density of, of mercury, for instance, is, is I think it's 13.6, I think. It's really dense, and uh, that means most things float in it. And I, I, I've never done this, but I've heard people, like they, they tell people, like, uh, like back in the day when they had huge vats of mercury, and they're like, oh, yeah, why don't you go lie in it? See what it's like. And there's pictures of people lying in mercury. Uh, so, and, and it's, of course, they, they float very easily in, in mercury. And uh, another thing I, I heard is that they, uh, one of the things they said, like, uh, they would try to tell people to, they had a big vat of mercury, like a, like a big barrel full of mercury, like, try and put your arm, how far you can pull your arm down in that vat of mercury. And apparently that's a very weird sensation of trying to push your arm down into that big vat of mercury. So, but yeah, there's a the density, here's the, the density using various substances, so... So here are some other densities. Uh, titanium. Titanium is very strong as well, uh, so it's used, and it's, it's expensive, so you can use titanium very frequently for certain things. They use it in a lot of, uh, so like fighter jets, for instance, can, can use it. Uh, iron, we use iron for quite a bit of things. Copper, copper is a little more dense, and you can see here, lead, gold, platinum, you get more and more dense up there. So there, there are... Uh, more dense things as you as you well ruthenium it depends on on the source ruthenium or iridium is the is the most uh, i give you two different elements there those are the most dense elements uh at least at this temperature and pressure and uh ruthenium is a theoretical a limit but it hasn't been observed as of yet so it depends on who you want to consider to be ruthenium or or um or iridium being the most dense element so let's review here. Uh, we talked quite a bit about uh, uh, taking measurements and uh, measuring quantities. So uh, when we report things, we try to say how well we know the measurements. And uh, we can describe things by, uh, by significant figures. And, um, and this has changed quite a bit. I remember my advisor, he, he was, uh, he's, 
relatively old. And he says, I remember when we went from analog to digital and, and it was actually kind of a, a hard thing for some people to switch from analog to digital because they no longer, they became very proud at how well they could read instruments. And now a computer just would spit out so many digits. We didn't know what to do. So, but uh, it just depends on the application. Uh, certain things are still analog. Certain things are still digital. Sometimes we humans prefer analog things. Uh, an example is uh, pilots. Air, airplane pilots prefer analog over digital because as long as everything is pointing straight up, they know the plane is flying fine. So looking at a bunch of numbers uh, can can drive some pilots crazy, whereas looking at dials is much easier. So it really depends on the application uh, of of which which things we want to do analog versus digital. Uh, but we do have a way of knowing how, how well we know something, and we, and we do that with significant figures. And uh, units then, we have different units. We have the base units, and then we can apply uh, the, the prefix to them. Uh, so large numbers or small numbers, depending on the basic units, and we can use the same thing to describe very big things or very small things. Uh, we also mentioned density, and it's just mass divided by volume, and uh, we can do certain calculations with this. And this is the learning objectives for this section. And then here is uh, an issue. So uh, we lost a Mars Climate Orbiter, and it was due to calculations. What's weird about a NASA, NASA actually doesn't use the metric system. NASA reports everything in feet and miles and pounds. Uh, so uh, we, if you ever look at NASA reporting things, you're going to see things in miles and feet and various things. So the, NASA decided to continue using the imperial system, uh, or some people call it the American system. But there are two groups, and they used different calculations, and then uh, there was an incorrect uh, um, we the units were not were not uh, reported and and we they used different units and because of that they lost the uh, the um, lost the orbiter so uh, this is quite the difference so it was it was uh, like I said the wrong thing and uh, NASA still sticks to to uh, doesn't use the metric system it uses the imperial system so it's interesting that that NASA has this is the line in the sand for NASA. They decided to go with this. So interesting thing if you ever work for NASA. So, and thank you for listening, and I hope you uh, enjoy this chapter, and then the next one is up for you.